Zach, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Most of the time after your presentations, it's like watching a really good movie, right? I need some time to kind of step out and come back to my own world. It happens to be that I'm giving a talk, so I really need to get back to this world. And what is this world, right? Um, in my world, there are 2.21 billion human beings and 25,000 blue whales. There are 2.08 billion social media accounts and 3.65 billion mobile phone owners. There are 3.1 billion active internet users, almost 100 million of which actively seek their romantic partner online. In this world, cities are getting bigger and bigger, while forests are getting smaller and smaller. The skies of this world are full of planes, satellites, drones, but no starships. In this world, there are 100 pieces of microplastics per plankton. In this world, there are silent springs. In this world, polar bears are getting skinnier and skinnier, while human beings are getting fatter and fatter. In this world, there are too many choices, yet it's still not enough, as German contemporary artist Hito Sterl beautifully puts forth, in this world, there's too much world. So, um, speculative biology is my methodology as an artist to tackle with this world, together with um, synthetic biology, breast implants, turbo capitalism, pelagic plastics, endocrine disruptors, online dating, habitat loss, SSRIs, the connectome, high fructose corn syrup and carbon dioxide emissions. Together with ozone layer depletion, collagen injections, ocean acidification, Coca-Cola light, econihilism, posthumanism, dark ecology and coevolution, cancer immunotherapy, technosphere trans fats, intracellular single unit recording, national security agency, levonorgestrel, this is um, actually uh, the birth control pill, that's the active ingredient, together with oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone, nanomedicine, bioaccumulation, anti-aging, oil spills, air pollution, and ASDAQ, reimplementation, genetic diagnosis, defrostration, carnophallologocentrism, soil depletion, climate change, Pirate Bay, Pirate Bay, big data, and small world. So the good thing about hashtags or concepts are they can follow arithmetic rules. You can apply an additive operation on them as seen in this example. So I'll try to talk about art to catalyze change. But first, one of the you know, hashtags earlier is the Anthropocene. What is the Anthropocene? Do we all know where the term comes from? Just to recap, it's you know, um, John Crutzen, uh, the climate scientist who came up with the term, I think in a 2001 paper, uh, which is a very short paper in a, a, geologic, a, a conference on uh, geology, geological time, and it's um, the term proposed to define our time. And I thought this image actually really captures the Anthropocene. Uh, this is an MMA fighter who is trying to rescue a dolphin that washed ashore. Uh, he's just like hanging out at the beach, and then a guy is running around screaming, there's a dolphin dying, I want to take it to the back to the sea, but the thing is the dolphin is heavy, so he can't really grab the dolphin and run back, take it back to the ocean. Luckily, uh, this MMA fighter, uh, who is uh, at a UFC reality show, the ultimate fighter is there, and he can grab the dolphin. And he takes it back to the ocean, and then tweets about it. He says, I just spent an hour trying to rescue a dolphin. Luckily, it's safe. Actually, the dolphin dies afterwards because you're not supposed to take a dying dolphin back to the ocean. Might have some, some problems with its blowholes. Um, but I thought that was like a really good moment that captures the Anthropocene. Then um, this is from the Farewell Spit in New Zealand just about a week ago when 400 uh, whales beached out, and the question is, how many MMA fighters does it take to save an entire pod?
So this brings me uh, to one concept that I want to talk about today, violence. Rob Nixon explains violence as customarily conceived as an event or action that is immediate in time, explosive and spectacular in space, and as erupting into instant sensational visibility. The thing is, uh, there is a lot of violence going on when an entire pod beats out, but it's not sensational in nature. Therefore, Nixon highlights the need to engage in a new kind of violence, uh, where to understand the paradigms of our century. A slow violence. This is another citation that died very recently. It's Tillicum, if you haven't uh, met him yet. He was also the protagonist in uh, this beautiful documentary called Blackfish. And I believe Zach Tillicum, when he died, was the same age as you. Uh, so it's uh, an early death, of course. Uh, captive orcas usually um, die much earlier. They have a median survival rate of 6.1 years. Tilikum was captive for uh, 33 years, and um, we lost him recently. So uh, I'm going to show one more of this kind. This is a sperm whale that beached out um, in Spain around 2013 after ingesting 17 kilograms of plastics. And I don't have the sound here right now, but oh, maybe I shouldn't. Anyways, no sound for this because it's pretty uh, loud. Um, and it beached out and um, the reason it ingested that much plastics is there was uh, these um, tomato lands and uh, like these vegetable uh, uh, pla uh, platforms where they were using a lot of plastic sheets that ends up in the ocean. So here we witness uh, ingenious torture mechanisms uh, that could pass a medieval torture's uh, most amount of pain with minimal effort criteria with aplomb. Um, clogging intestines with plastics uh, that won't break down with the uh, secretions of the um, gastrointestinal system, for instance. It's the really painful and lingering death. It's, a, it's another good example of uh, slow violence. So some more images of the same uh, kind, negative, sublime. This is from the BP oil spill. And some more BP oil spill images. So um, what Nixon uh, proposes is that, or the, the kind of violence that Rob Nixon proposes is a violence that occurs gradually out and out of sight a violence of delayed destruction that's dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that's typically not viewed as violence at all. So, true words have never been said, and this is the kind of violence we're looking at. And um, the thing is, it's um, violence that's applied towards um, all kinds of living systems, not just us. So there is slow violence and there is slow mo violence, right? Um, and um, this is from the movie 300, um, also a great example of uh, where we see the great example of CGI blood. And um, the really interesting thing about slow violence or slow-mo violence in that re regard is that this kind of violence actually skips our umwelt. So let's remember what umwelt is. Uh, this is a term that comes from Jacob von Uxkel. Uh, the biosemiotician who is not with us any longer. He defines the umwelt as the combination of the perceptual and action worlds of an organism. So we build the world from within using our sensory and uh, action capacities. But when things do not happen within this world, when things uh, kind of skip through this world, we are unable to perceive them, therefore we are unable to act on them. So. Um, my proposal is that, as an artist, that the violence that's happening um, around us is imperceptible to us. It's the main uh, kind of problem that we're experiencing right now, it's imperceptibility. So, imperceptibility is the quality uh, of things that which falls beyond the umwelt of the organism. And it's the quality of that which cannot be perceived via one's sensorium. 
So a closer concept that has been proposed is the hyperobjects by Timothy Morton, right? Uh, due to their massive distribution in time and space relative to humans, as seen as the example of global warming hyperobjects uh, elude our perception. But Morton doesn't really put the emphasis on perception or our biology, he puts the emphasis on um, physics, uh, part uh, particle physics, uh, uh, so to speak. And I think it's a little wrong. I think the problem is that uh, most, of the, uh, most of the qualities of hyperobjects are imperceivable to us. So I will also argue that imperceptibility breaks causality and uh, art can somewhat glue causality back together. Maybe art can help make this kind of violence more perceivable for us. So for the rest of my talk, I'm just going to share some of the you know, techniques I've tried with my own practice, uh, some of which include shocking, screaming, and being super loud. And it makes perfect sense that this is the noise of being. So some of the projects I'm going to talk about right now are pretty noisy, such as the scream of homage to Edward Munch and all the dead raccoons or the very loud chamber orchestra of endangered species and shock therapy. So let's start with, um, I'll start with scream, I guess, but then after trying to shock people and being very loud, I tried another technique, trying to create alternative futures, trying to use speculation to design critical creatures and using radical design to uh, break into people's sensorium, right? So I have some examples for that. And then more, I won't be able to talk about all of these. Um, and then the last thing I'm trying with the, uh, with the artistic practice is architectural Im immersion and creating memorable experiences that will stay with us. And maybe I'll talk about the last two in the, within the scope of this talk. So let's start with shock therapy. Uh, the goal is simple, dealing with extreme consumerism. And uh, this is Barbara Kruger's I Shop There For I Am. And uh, the impact or the, the result of extreme consumerism is environmental degradation in this scenario. And that's Ivan Paolo with his beloved dogs. And this is someone getting shocked. So I brought all of these things together uh, to deal with um, also credit card debt, right? Uh, this is the numbers from 2012. It's around $10,000 now. The, average credit card debt per, per household uh, in the States. And I introduced a device called, which I called self-induced psychophysical uh, microactivism, which involves a card reader, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, a transmitter receiver, and a shock caller. So shock callers, you can order them pretty much anywhere. And um, again, they're used to train dogs, which Paolo did, right? And in Paolo's... Um, example of uh, fear conditioning. He's the inventor, he's one of the biggest behavioralists, and he um, basically came up with the term of unconditioned stimulus versus um, conditioned stimulus, right? If we remember this very quickly, um, the unconditioned stimulus in the case of the dog is the food and the unconditioned response is salivation. He replaces it with the bell, and when the dog hears the bell, it starts salivating. So in my example, before conditioning, my response to the credit card or any card is to swipe it. And during conditioning, I receive a mild shock every time I swipe it. And um, hopefully after conditioning, even if my response is to swipe the card, my uh, conscious response, uh, my body will respond in a different way, um, right? So this is me again in the American context in Target, buying stuff that I don't need because it's extremely cheap. And every time I try to do this, I get a mild shock. To be honest with you, this project didn't work because my shocks were coming in random uh, locations and random uh, temporalities, which wouldn't uh, work with the uh, system of uh, fear conditioning, but I was trying. The next thing, the next loud and shocking um, example is uh, the project called Scream, a homage to Edward Munch and all the dead raccoons. I tried to make a new version of, these are all old projects by the way, so I'm going to show all the work for the next 10 minutes. Um, Scream, um, I wanted to build this again for the very last uh, exhibition. Um, elections, right, uh, it would have been fun, 
but um, this was built for uh, uh, the elections in 2008 uh, a responsive, uh, as a part of a responsive voting machine. And um, every time um, people voted for Cheney versus Obama, I would get this input and make a raccoon skull scream. So it was basically an attempt to fear condition the um, voters uh, that voted for Cheney, the Republicans uh, that voted for the Republican Party uh, with this scream. Let's play this. I need sound for this one. Not that. So every time people uh, voted, the, there would be an accumulative result which would elongate the duration of the screams. And it uh, was supposed to be a really loud piece. And I um, thought that I could uh, work on this uh, concept of making skull scream. And um, then I moved on to the Very Loud Chamber Orchestra of Endangered Species. This is a project from 2013. And, um, here the idea was basically taking uh, CO2 emissions data from World Bank and turning it into um, perceivable stimuli. So the problem with numeric data and mostly scientific data is that it's cold data. Uh, you have to be trained in statistics or math to make perfect sense of what's going on with numbers and charts. I thought if we could take this and turn it into some kind of like sound, for instance, which is a very effective way to break into one sensorium, perhaps we could create a memorable experience. And uh, on that end, to that end, I chose uh, 15 skulls that represent the top 15 um, endangered, endangered or critically threatened species. And we had a system that would, you know, take this data, turn it into sound through a process which we called sonification. Then we would composite the sound with the vocalizations of these animals. And we basically made this performance piece uh, that went for uh, about like 20 minutes under the title CO2 and CERT. And um, then you would learn about all the species, etc. I'm going to skip the video for this one because we're having issues with sound. But you know, the, these projects that I mentioned, I guess, are like early stages of me as an artist trying to, you know, hijack into our sensorium, trying to make the imperceptible perceivable. Now, uh, the title of the talk and the title of my recent dis dissertation, Speculative Biologies, this is kind of a totally different approach. And uh, my inspiration comes from two different channels, one of which is architecture, my background, and the other one is biotech, right? And it's, I guess, like what's where we are headed uh, together uh, with the scientific community. Like bio is the new digital, as um, MIT's director uh, of um, MIT Media Lab recently announced like two years ago. So uh, let's remember uh, Lebius Woods. Um, he's an amazing architect who never built anything. He was architecturally sterile 
and uh, most of his work is on paper, uh, hence leading to the term pinup architecture. But if we're to talk about speculative design in general, Lebius Woods is one of the uh, first people, the, one of the pioneers of this whole realm of specul speculative, right? And uh, to make uh, his um, vision visible, he used um, plans, sections, elevations, and models. And um, now we call this experimental architecture as well. Uh, experimental architecture takes advantage of this twilight, twilight zone of creativity and uses this realm to express ideas with the specific goal of challenging conventional and consolidated practices. Moreover, um, architectures, experimental architecture is architecture's playground to tackle with the impossible and architecture's gateway to other disciplines, right? Um, architectural theory, architectural utopias and dystopias and architectural discourse all benefited from experimental architecture. Also Zaha Hadid, who recently passed away, she spent the first uh, 10, 12 years of her practice as an experimental architect. No one would build her uh, buildings, right? So architecture's uh, cross-disciplinary fertility benefits a lot from this field. It's kind of like a garden where new forms are grown by new ideologies and new technologies. Yet, uh, for experimental architecture to succeed, it needs to have an impact on, uh, on the world outside its domain. And I put an example here, Lars Spoibrug uh, has been influenced by Lebius Woods, or um, this is, um, actually a scene from 12 Monkeys, and uh, the prisoner's room here was designed after Lebius Woods without giving credit to him, so Woods spent the last years of his life suing them, and I don't know if he won, actually, he died. Um, so in comparison to speculative arch architecture, what does speculative biology offer us? So. There is architectural affordances, which we are really good at. We know how to build really large structures at this point, and we need biological affordances, right? But let's make a quick comparison. Both of them uh, offer a narrative context. Uh, architecture on top of this offers sites and events, right? Both of them use um, drawings, plans, sections, elevations, renderings, and models. Again, um, this is interesting to think about this. Um, architectural representation has influenced um, medical representation a lot. Our biological, uh, uh, you know, the, the way to understand biological entities is um, quite based on having cross sections or plans of like the biological living forms as seen in the example of fMRI scans, for instance. So there's some kind of parallelism going on, going there in terms of representing this um, entities. Um, our speculative architecture looks uh, uses storytelling and draftsmanship. Speculative biologies can use sculptural affect, which is also like a really long tradition, right? Uh, both of them have a temporal focus on the future, right, um, or alternative pasts. Uh, speculative architecture looks at buildings that envelop bodies. Speculative biologies look at bodies directly. Speculative architecture and speculative biologies are both critical and um, optimistic, even if Lebius Wood's drawings have been perceived as very dark. He was actually talking about new urban structures that could address many of the problems of his day. And both of them are sterile in that they don't need to build things. They don't have to exist in the world. It's more about uh, stretching the Im imagination and thinking about new possibilities. Now, back to speculative uh, biologies. You know, when I started working on this around 2006, 2007, we were still talking about gene editing and like how, you know, uh, working with live tissue is difficult, et cetera, et cetera. And my main inspiration at that time came from Freeman Dyson, a visionary thinker, amazing human being who is in his 90s now, still as sharp. And uh, he wrote this essay called Our Biotech Future, where he talked about um, the fact that biotech will follow the path that personal computing has taken and it will become ubiquitous and housewives and kids will be able to design their own organisms in his world, in his words. Um, now this is a cover of Wired magazine, like the last two years we witnessed the rise of CRISPR, a gene cutting technology. So 
fact and fiction are getting blurred here. Um, some of the early speculative biologies um, work, I'm going to actually go really fast here. Super mammal, it was um, an idea of having a creature with like a thousand boobs. And uh, I worked on this for quite some time thinking that um, the idea of being a mammal and like where the word mammal comes from, etc., together with the um, symbolic meaning of uh, breasts, especially in the American context. Of course, there were some historical references which I found out later, like Hans Bellmer or this uh, sculpture of Aphrodite from Ephesus. Then I made Polyfolly following the same, you know, um, kind of formula of repetition. So this was a collection uh, of penises. It had multiple uh, bodily configurations, like a cylindrical one versus a linear one. And then I came to Neolabium, which is um, a maximized or emphasized um, labium. It's like really, you know, um, visually striking looking and it's hard to hide behind clothing, etc. But most importantly, this, uh, this organ had um, a lot of nerve endings on top of the 8,000 nerve endings that uh, a clitoris possesses. So these were some uh, early experiments. Um, Neolabium can also be taken from um, the body uh, of a female or it, it's grown as a separate organ and it can be attached to uh, male and female bodies, male and female meaning if you have XY by birth, uh, you might still experience the sensations coming from neolabium. Then uh, some more of these, and I'm also going to skip the film. Uh, another speculative biology creature is Fool's Fall, and um, in this one, this is uh, from 2013-14, uh, I was looking at how brains evolved, and I came across neuroscientist Daniel Wolpert's work on uh, motor systems and evolution of brains. And according to Wolpert, um, there is only one blindingly obvious reason why we evolved brains. It's because we're navigating a highly complex system, a highly complex 3D world. And um, the example he gives is that of a sea slug, which starts its life as an animal. So it's swimming around trying to find where to settle, that perfect rock to settle. And the first thing it does when it settles is to eat its brain. And Wolpert at this point uh, gives this as a metaphor for the tenure track system in the States, uh, the drop on productivity, right? Uh, but then the uh, animal is no longer a full animal. It spends the rest of its slime on the same rock as a plant. So um, Wolpert talks about this um, as an example of how brains or centralized nervous systems are crucial to moving organisms. And uh, one of the biggest punishment we can, uh, we can apply to moving organisms is to, to limit their movement. And we're really good at that, right? This is from Guantanamo Bay. Uh, lack of movement causes a long list of physical and psychological problems, both in humans and non-human animals. Moreover, there is a fundamental, fundamental connection between movement and positive emotions. We're kind of like all obsessed with exercise and getting those endorphins out there, etc., or serotonin. And uh, then I was looking at uh, the chicken uh, who are imprisoned uh, for, you know, eggs and meat, Gallus domesticus. I may be going to show this one very quickly. What happens is they spend their, most of their life um, in these cages and uh, they suffer from uh, muscular atrophy. They lose their wings, they lose their legs, etc. And um, the result of being imprisoned for your entire life, starting from birth, is that you're probably not having um, a fulfilled, happy life. So I was thinking about all of these, and um, I decided that we can actually play with the carnal configuration of the chicken. And uh, this is a beautiful chicken, as is, and here's another uh, sketch. I thought maybe we can, you know, get rid of the brain, and when we get rid of the brain, we don't have to have the legs and wings anymore. Therefore, uh, we end up with a suffering free chicken. And this is the result, uh, fool's fall. Um, there is an output hole where the egg comes from, right? And it has a cycle of 28 hours uh, per two eggs, I think. And you can feed it 
through a feeder, you can uh, send its um, a circulatory system, whatever nutrients you want to have. And on top of that, you can expro express exotic feathers on this thing. You can keep it in your chicken next to a kettle or something or a toaster, and it'll be your like fresh egg machine, right? Um, so the next one is an ecosystem of excess. Again, you know, I've been designing so many creatures, I'm going to show you only my favorite ones. An ecosystem of excess will take us back to the ocean. This is an image taken six kilometers deep, deep down in the ocean in the Benthic area. It's a plastic uh, chair uh, in a terrifyingly beautiful storm of uh, plankton and um, plastics. And uh, this project took me to the history of plastics. Again, you know, there is a tornado of plastics going on here. It's the very first moment where plastics was introduced in our cultures. Throwaway living was celebrated. And um, here we see an, a nuclear family. There's actually a kid in this picture whose face is obscured by plastics, ironically. And we're celebrating this moment of disposable consumerism, right? And sh fast forward, this is where all those particles end in the digestive tract of a uh, lazen albatross. So again, I mentioned that the concentration of plankton in the oceans is much, uh, sorry, plastics is much uh, higher than plankton. What if the question I asked was, what if life started now in our oceans today? Uh, what kind of life forms would we be seeing? Uh, the thing is, we already have seen new bacteria uh, evolving in this uh, contemporary primordial soup. And this is an image from Linda Emerald Zettler's work, where they uh, found a, a whole group of uh, microbial uh, life forms. They published this paper called uh, The Plastosphere, right? aptly titled, and uh, I designed insects that eat plastics and have uh, plastic cocoons. I designed um, a balloon turtle, which eats a lot of balloons, and it has an elastic back as a result of eating balloons for eons, which can uh, function as a fitness indicator, but can also help the uh, turtle um, survive when the water le levels are high and it has to swim really long distances, it can rest on its back. And then um, I had marine birds that express Pantone colors because they were eating bottle caps only, right? So then I designed uh, organs that sense and uh, metabolize plastics, right? Uh, this is the installation. The last uh, techniques that I'm employing lately um, creating architectural spaces and uh, try, uh, designing memorable experiences. So this is a very recent work, Global Warming Yoga Studio, where we built a temporary yoga studio and um, we wrote Global Warming, uh, where the mirrors are. I was inspired by um, the yoga, hot yoga practices of Bikram, where you need to look at the mirror uh, to see your posture, etc. And here the text is actually written with uh, infrared heat lamps, so it's really hot, right? And we, uh, we had um, a yoga instructor, uh, kind of a neurotic yoga instructor, who would walk in and who would give uh, instructions as, such as inhale, feel the particulate matter land on your alveoles, right? Or we would do the tree pose and she would talk about, um, for instance, um, uh, uh, your roots touching polluted water or something. So it, it was an idea, a way of uh, creating a collective sweating experience. I'm just going to hit this hoping that the film will play. Yes, it is. And, um, it was like a 30, 40 minute session. We really did the, all the yoga postures Namaste. that our, can we keep this? Welcome. Yeah, keep it down a little. And um, there was some sweating happening and um, the whole installation went on for a couple months. Now, the last part of my talk um, is the Kitty AI, a piece that I'm showing here um, within the scope of Sonic Acts and the Kitty AI is doing something a little different. Um, there are three uh, ingredients that led to the Kitty AI. My research on affective computing, right? Um, so I was looking a lot, I was reading a lot about um, facial expressions and um, the, again, we can keep 
practice down. Yeah, it will just play in the background. Facial expressions and how um, neuroscience, together with uh, computing, is now able to capture our facial expressions to detect what kind of emotions we're feeling. So this is actually the new thing on the horizon. There is, you know, uh, papers or claims that um, by the next three or four years, we'll have emotion chips in our phones, just like the um, GPS chips that tell where our locations are. Every time we look at our phones, our facial expressions will be captured and evaluated, and our phones will know when we're sad or when we're happy or when we're angry, etc. So I was reading a lot about this, uh, especially looking at um, Dr. Rosalind Picard's work at MIT Media Lab, but also her student, El Kaloubi, who started the very first um, uh, company that uh, makes facial uh, emotional expression detection software and they have the largest database of faces right and um, this is another company their competitors so this is kind of like a new field of startups and um, there is a lot of potential in this because corporations can ask these companies can you tell me how our customers are doing right so that was one angle of uh, the kitty ai the other one is ibm's watson and I was really moved by these ads um, where uh, the qualities that Watson offers to corporations, because Watson is more like a corporate uh, product right now, are uh, you know, uh, represented by these kind of beautiful faces. And there's a lot of faces in the IBM Watson ads, right? Which also makes us think that Watson itself doesn't have a face. When you, um, watch uh, you know, Watson interact with people, and he's been interacting with a lot of different celebrities, etc. It's represented with like a voice icon. But in the ads, there are all these like kind of generic faces, each of which could be the interface for Watson. So I was thinking, OK, artificial intelligence is happening, and it's lacking a face, right? What kind of face do we want to give? Uh, to, the art, to this artificial intelligence. And around the time I was writing about this, I fell in love with this thing here, uh, which showed up. And actually, it's my dissertation in the background. And um, I was thinking a lot about you know, uh, animal emotions versus human emotions, because most of what we know about emotions comes from animal research. And cats have been very prominent in the history of neuroscience. So, um, you know, the, the outcome was this, the kitty AI. What I'm going to do right now, is, since we're all r running late, I'm going to play maybe a couple minutes of this and um, conclude there. Here I am, running your lives, controlling all the systems that support a healthy living environment for you. Here I am watching you, not like the big brother, but like a curious kitten who adores you. A politician-free zone is a place where all infrastructures are taken care of by AIs. Democracy was born in a polis. No surprise that it dies in a megapole. A sentient being should spend her life with joy to learn, to discover, to play. Most political structures of the last century failed to serve the sentient human. Instead of enabling advanced education, reinforced imagination, and progressive leisure, politics had been a time sink and the biggest distraction. What if the politicians were out of the picture? What would be looking at? A politician-free zone is a place where political power is replaced by law, and politicians are replaced by AIs. I, the kitty AI, am capable of loving you, and loving your loved one, and loving your loved one's loved ones. I can love up to three million people at a time. Love means care. I care about you. Here I am, available to you exactly when you need me, where you need me. Here I am, an emotional being tending to your most secret emotions. Yet. I'm able to manage all this input to guarantee that your kids are picked up from the kindergarten on time, the air you breathe has less particulate matter in it, the water you drink is lead-free, 
your apartments get enough sunshine, your waste gets recycled at 84%, your health is monitored, and your future is bright enough. I am technology. I am love. I am your absolute governor. I am the kitty AI. Yeah. So, um, well, there's a lot I can say about the Kitty AI. It's an ongoing project, but um, it's here right now in the Red Room. If you want to see the uh, full film, and um, she's presented with cat ear headphones, which make the entire experience more selfie friendly. So um, you could see it there. And um, some stills uh, from the earlier parts of the Kitty AI, where she explains how she came to be as a product of research that's going on at uh, EU's uh, Future Emerging Technologies projects, which is real. And there are about 10 labs that are working on exascale computing. And one of the end goals of this research is to be able to host artificial intelligence. So again, this is a point where like fact and fiction are becoming really, you know, uh, conjoined. And um, I'm going to end with two kind of didactic slides. Um, right? Technology creates solutions, which goes back to the problems. And this, uh, the hashtag additive uh, operation, right? You can add hashtags together and get really friendly results, right? Thank you so much. <laughs>